one of those real challenging areas that uh, that we that we need to work on and, and always be be aware of. This year we had a had a, a pretty serious rash of this as we had a had a wintry conditions over the northern northern part of the state. Um, and so I think this is a very timely subject as well. Brent, you good to go? Good to go. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Right. Thanks for coming right. today. And uh, we're going to jump in here. Like Jason said, it's one of the, the leading causes of claims that we have is slips, trips, and falls. And, and part of that is uh, looking at our, our surfaces that we work on. Part of that is managing them. So we'll look at those things today. I'm going to talk to you about a few things that OSHA has, some, some new updates that they have. They have some new changes to their OSHA standards as far as walking and working surfaces go. And I will highlight some of those things that you might want to pay attention to and talk about what we can do to prevent the claims there. Uh, this is going to be a high-level overview only. There's a lot of detail in the, in the regulations. As you know, they can be sometimes pages long. Um, I'm just going to point out some of the key things that, that might apply to us. Uh, we're going to look at basic requirements. We're going to look at implementation dates. There's some certain dates that OSHA has uh, with these new updates to their standard that they want us to be aware of and, and things that we need to have uh, certain things done by. And so we'll, we'll look at those and realize that the applicability may vary. You know, each organization is different. You know, some have ladders that they work on in, in accessing places. Some use fall protection. Some just work in, in places with stairways. Um, but, but anyway, we all have walking and working services that we work on. And uh, so we can learn from that as we go through. So a couple of abbreviations I, I thought I would point out here so that you're not walking in the dark today. Uh, STF, that's slips, trips, and falls, would be the abbreviation there. PFAS is a personal fall arrest system, and we'll talk about that, what that means uh, as far as fall protection goes. And WWS, walking and working surfaces. So we'll get started here, and I'll talk about a few things uh, that apply to all of us. So really, slips, trips, and falls. Uh, as Jason mentioned, is, is the leading cause of serious work-related injuries and deaths. Uh, people die uh, simply from slipping and falling down, sometimes even on the same level. Um, I've even heard of some people dying on, off of a ladder, falling off of a ladder even only four feet high, falling and hitting their head wrong and, and dying from that. And, and uh, OSHA estimates it's about 20% of all disabling injuries are due to falls. And about 15% of accidental deaths in the workplace are from falls. And so. There's, there's some serious things, and, and some of you may have fallen down before. There may be a, a time in your life where you had a serious fall, maybe at home or in the workplace. And, and one thing to think about is, you know, what were you doing right before that fall happened? Uh, just prior to falling down, were you carrying something heavy that got you off balance? Uh, were you not paying attention to where you're walking? Maybe you weren't using the handrail going down stairways. Uh, but think about it. Think about what you're doing. Uh, right before that fall, and, and those are the things that we can change and we can correct to prevent slips, trips, and falls. So we're going to highlight some of those today and things that we can do to improve those. Looking at the claims this year, uh, as Jason mentioned, it's always one of the top either one or two things uh, that drive the claims. Looking at workers' comp claims here at the Trust, this is throughout the state, uh, there's 191 claims regarding uh, pertaining to slips and falls. Uh, obviously, the highest one, and, and second would be strains. Those are often hand in hand. It's either one of those two uh, that are the highest uh, occurring cause that we see. And then looking at the cost on the right-hand side of the graph, you can see that it's almost $2 million worth of claims in, in slips and falls. So it's pretty serious. We want to look at our workplaces. We want to see what we can do to prevent these and not have these types of accidents reoccurring. Okay. Uh, so in 2010, OSHA put some numbers together. They had a bunch of information on on slips and falls, and they wanted to see what is causing the deaths in the workplace. What's causing people to fall and die uh, in the workplace? 20% of the time, which was the highest one here, uh, was from falling off of a ladder. 18% falling off a roof, and surprisingly, 15% on the same level. Uh, tripping, slipping, falling on the same level that you're standing on. People have actually died from that. Uh, and there's other reasons we'll look at as well. Stairways, scaffolding, open edges, docks, those are all examples of working surfaces. Uh, where people could get hurt on. So let's look at some of those things. Uh, slip, trip, falls, risks. What, what risks are there? Well, sloped surfaces are one. When there's a slope, sometimes we can easily slip or fall down those. Uneven terrain, maybe on job sites or in shops or places that we work, that's, that's a risk as well. Loose floorboards, wet and muddy floor conditions, uh, getting in and out of equipment. There's been a, a an increase recently in claims of, of people getting in and out of equipment where they're twisting their ankles, twisting their knees, falling down. Uh, maybe they're not using their three points of contact and, and falling just from getting in and out of heavy equipment. 
Irregular surfaces, objects left in the walking paths, those are all things we can check for to prevent uh, the risk there. So why do slip, trip, and fall injuries occur? Why, why does this happen? Well, one is a slip, which we'll look at. A slip, the definition is that it's too little of friction or traction between the feet and the surface, resulting in a loss of balance. And I'm sure a lot of you have slipped at some time in your life. Uh, maybe it's out on ice outside or some type of surface you're walking on, but it can catch you by surprise, and it can often lead to injuries. So a slip is one. Uh, trip, here's another one we may have encountered. Foot or lower leg hits an object, and the upper body continues moving, resulting in a loss of balance. And, and I'm sure you've seen that happen before, kind of like the picture shows here. Or the other one is stepping down to a lower surface and losing your balance. Maybe there's a ledge or something that you step on, uh, but there's, there's reasons why trips happen, and we can prevent those by looking at our workplaces and, and watching for those things. Uh, and then the last one is falls. What is a fall? There's two different types. One is falling at the same level or falling to a lower level. Kind of like Wiley Coyote knows, he's, he's learned from experience that fall to a lower level can be pretty bad. So there's two examples there uh, of what can happen with that. What we see as far as injuries, when people slip, trip, or fall, the types of injuries that are common are sprains and strains. Sometimes people will go to catch themselves. Their first instinct when they go to fall is to reach out and put their arms out straight and catch themselves. And often that leads to straining a shoulder or straining joints or or maybe they fall and hit their head and get bruises or fractures or, or other cuts, lacerations, things like that. Those are common things that we see uh, from slip, strip, fall injuries. Uh, the common body parts that get hurt from this, like I mentioned, could be shoulders, could be your head that gets hit on the ground, uh, knees and ankles, sometimes they get twisted or, or sprained, uh, and wrists and elbows when you go to catch yourself. There's a lot of different parts. Um, but really, we got to be really careful because we can have some serious injuries from those things. We've seen some really, really serious injuries happen just from simply walking and, and doing, doing things on a regular basis on a regular walking surface, and it can happen. Uh, a few years ago, I was working for another company, and one of our worst injuries that we had in the whole organization was a guy that was walking down the stairs. Uh, he, he wasn't holding the handrail. He was just simply walking down the steps in an office building, nothing, nothing really out of the ordinary but missed his step on the stairs and fell and ended up breaking his femur. Really, really bad break. He was out of work for a while, really painful. Uh, and it can happen just from simply walking down steps or walking maybe on a carpeted area or on a slick floor. Uh, simple things like that can sometimes get us if we're not paying attention. And that's what we want to watch for. So OSHA looked at this in the past past couple years. They, they looked at this and they thought, you know, what's, what's causing all of these slip, trip, fall accidents and what can we do to update our standards to make it so we can we can prevent some of these. So they looked at this. It had been over 20 plus years since they revised their standard on walking working surfaces and there were some things that were outdated. And so they wanted to look at this and make some updates and changes to it. And so they updated their walking work is walking and working surface standard and it really covers all, all types of surfaces that we work on or anything that we access to get to those work, working spaces. Uh, and so in 2011, they started some hearings and comments. They started to, to reach out to the industry, see what people thought about it, and, and eventually started putting some things together. They had some drafts. They had some proposals. And in November of last year, November of 2016, uh, they had the final rule published in the Federal Register where they, where they put this into place. And with that comes some, some dates where they made this effective, which was as of uh, January 17th of this year, 2017. And there's also some other dates thereafter where there are certain requirements of things that we need to do. And I'll highlight those here shortly uh, of some of those updates, the key updates, and the dates where we need to have some things done by. And so the purpose, the reason why they did this is they want to be able to prevent fatalities. They don't want injuries and fatalities in the workplace. And they estimated that by making these simple changes in the standard, it can prevent 29 fatalities and 5,842 lost workday injuries every year. And so we know that there's a lot more than that. There's more fatalities, there's more injuries that occur but they, they estimate that these changes can make that big of a difference, and uh, probably rightfully so if we can do those things. Um, so looking at this, benefits of this update to the standard, uh, it creates a greater flexibility for selecting fall protection systems. Those that work at height, that work on top of roofs or, or up ladders or on elevated surfaces, um, there's some other flexibility. There's other options that the standard makes available with these updates. Uh, it also provides consistency between other OSHA standards. They, they've updated other standards in recent years. They've changed some of the wording. They've modernized it. They've incorporated new technology into these things. And the new standard goes right hand in hand with that, and so it all lines up and, and works with the other, other standards a little better. 
and it also replaces outdated specification requirements that they have that's changed over the years. So that's that's why the standard updated and, and there's some things we'll look at here shortly. So what is a walking working surface? What's, what's the definition that OSHA has of that? It's any horizontal or vertical surface on or through which an employee walks, works, or gains access to a work area or a workplace location. So it could be it could be a ramp, it could be a floor, it could be stairways, it could be ladders, dock boards in a warehouse or, or a shop. Uh, working on a roof, any type of walkway or walking path where employees go is considered a walking working surface. And so that's what this standard applies to that they updated. Uh, this is the standard here, 29 CFR 1910. There's a couple of subparts that were updated. And some of the key things that it addresses uh, that we need to be aware of is how it pertains to fixed ladders. Uh, so if you have fixed ladders in your workplace, you'll want to pay attention to this because there's some new changes and new requirements uh, that go along with that. Uh, it also applies to rope descent systems, fall protection systems, and different training requirements for employees that do work at height or training requirements for employees that, that might be exposed to a fall hazard or, or other serious injury in the workplace due to working at height. Um, so those are some of the updates there. Um, here's, here's some of the revisions. As far as training requirements go, uh, employees that are exposed to a fall, by May of this year, they want you to train, which should already be done, and we've, we've helped with some of that, uh, to ensure that exposed workers are trained on fall hazards, that they learn to recognize that, that they understand the risk, learn how to have the awareness about it and the right way to do that. And also along with that training is to ensure that workers who use the equipment that are covered by this new rule, the final rule, that they get the training that they need. And so this training should be ongoing whenever there's a new employee, whenever there's a new, new workplace where there's a fall hazard, there should be this training going on where the employee gets the, the awareness and training that he needs on the equipment and how to protect himself from falls. And so that should be an ongoing thing uh, that goes on there. Another thing they have is for the rope descent systems, uh, they require the inspection and certification of permanent anchorages for the rope descent systems. Now this is to be done by November of this year. So that's, that's ongoing as well. Uh, if you have any system like this, maybe it's a rope descent system from a ladder or other anchorages on the sides of buildings. Whatever, wherever it may be, uh, it's up to the employer to make sure that they're inspected and certified that they have that uh, 5,000 pound rating and, and can hold what they need to withstand. Uh, as far as fixed ladders go, any fixed ladder that's over 24 feet in height uh, needs to have some certain, certain components on it. And one is to install a personal fall arrest system or a ladder safety system on newer fixed ladders and on replacement ladder sections uh, by November of next year, November of 2018. Uh, and then any other fixed ladders you have, ensure that the existing ones that, are, that you already have in your organization, that they are equipped with a cage or well or a ladder safety system by, by next year in November. And so what OSHA is doing here is they're taking it away from just having uh, a cage or a well, and they're now leaning on going toward an actual personal fall arrest system or some type of safety, safety system that, that you attach to that catches you if you go to fall from, from a fixed ladder. And so down the road, they'll be looking for some other things there as well. So take a look at your fixed ladder. See if you have any that are over 24 feet in height. Uh, see what type of fall protection system you may have there. And you're going to want to start looking at a way to uh, protect the, from falls there with those types of systems. Um, other things they have is, is, and this is 20 years down the road, but they've marked this in their standard. 20 years down the road, 2036 is the year. By then, we need to replace out the cages and wells and change those out on, on the fixed ladders and put in the ladder safety system or the personal fall arrest system. That's on all ladders. Uh, all fixed ladders over 24 feet in height. So there's some key, key updates there and things to watch for. Um, other things they have in their walking working surface standard, uh, talk about surface conditions. This applies to any workplace, any, any general industry workplace, whether it's a shop, an office, a warehouse, uh, access to the locations, wherever it may be, it's a requirement to make sure that our surface conditions are kept clean and orderly and free of hazards. And that's, that's a good practice regardless whether it's in the standard or not, we should be doing that because that's what really prevents uh, slips, trips, and falls in the workplace. Uh, they need to be able to support the intended load. So if you're driving vehicles on it, they need to be strong enough to, to support that load. They need to be inspected regularly and as necessary. Now you can, you can determine what that may be, but as needed to make sure that it's kept clean and free of hazards. Uh, they also have uh, any correction or repairs supervised by a qualified person. And that's some of that wording that they updated in their standards, which is similar to other new standards where the qualified person is involved, someone who has knowledge and, and skills and abilities to look at something and make sure that it's being done right. So we need to make sure we know that as well. 
Ladders is a big part of this update. Um, need to make sure that each ladder meets the requirements uh, of the section. Ladders need to be free of hazards with no modifications, used as intended, kind of like the guy in this picture. He's not really using that ladder as, it, as intended. He's able to get up there, but that ladder is not set up in the right way and not used the right way. So we need to make sure we're using them properly. Make sure our ladders are inspected regularly. Make sure that when we're climbing, we're facing the ladder, that we always have at least one hand in contact. So we have, have good points of contact as we're going up the ladders. Those, those are all key things to watch for. Looking at the different types of ladders, on the left-hand side, we have a fixed ladder with, with a cage around it. Okay, good example there. On the right-hand side, we have a portable ladder, like an A-frame ladder. Obviously, the setup and the use is totally different for these. There's different, different ways to use it. There's different hazards, uh, different purposes, but we need to be trained on that to know how to do it safely. Uh, here's some examples of the many different types of ladders. This is a step ladder. Uh, it's got the steps. It should be opened fully with the cross braces fully opened. And as a reminder, we don't use those top two steps to stand on. They're only to uh, lean against as you're standing on, on the steps below. And so that's something to watch for there on ladders. But this is a step ladder. There's also single ladders, extension ladders, articulated ladders, extension trestle ladders, mobile ladder stands. There's a lot of different types of ladders out there with different purposes. Make sure you get the kind that's right for the use that you need, that it's inspected, and that it's used properly. Here's an example of the straight ladder. Okay, these, these should not be stacked up. They're not to be used as a scaffold. They're to lean against the surface with the right, right setup that you can go up and down on. Uh, one of the best things you can do is tie it off. Tie it off at the top, have somebody hold it at the bottom or secure it at the bottom so that it doesn't slip on you as you climb up and down. And, and uh, they're maximum 30 feet in length. They, they should be no taller, no longer than 30 feet in length. I can't imagine going up a 30-foot ladder anyway, but uh, you know, think about that. They shouldn't be any longer than that. And, and one thing when you're climbing up these ladders, here, here's just a tip. Keep your belt buckle inside the rails, okay? But you cowboys out there, if your buckle's outside of the rails, it's possible that you can fall, so, so pay attention to that. Just a tip there. Uh, looking at stairways, we all go up and down stairways regularly in our homes, in our offices, it's, it's in many workplaces, and this can affect a lot of us. Uh, the, the regulations for stairways have a few things here that are required. Uh, as far as handrails, stair rails, and, and if, if guardrails are needed when you get to the top, we'll look at some of those. But if stairs are installed in your workplace after January of this year, there's certain specifications in the standard that need to be followed. And, and some of these are basic, some of these have always been in place, but there's, there's some new details as well. Um, basically every stair, stairway, every flight of stairs having four or more risers, meaning four or more steps, shall be equipped with standard stair railings or standard handrails. Okay, and that, that goes for your home, that goes for your office. Uh, you know, you'll want to refer to your local building code as well. They'll have different specifications for your stairway, and they will also call out when, when handrails are needed and how they should be, be built and set up. So check your stairways, make sure that they have uh, those stair rails. Here's an example of a shop that we inspected in recent years. And, and they did a really good job of putting a nice stairway together. You can see it's got good guardrails, it's got something to hold on to as you go up. But you'll notice that as you get to the top of this, there's, there's an upper level there, an upper mezzanine or storage area, where an employee could walk up there and they're guarded until they get to that, that upper level. And, and it's there where we want to look for things. We want to look to have guardrails in place or, or things that we can do to prevent the falls from those areas. Okay, so that's one example. Other examples of the standard that they have uh, are dock boards. Those of you that have a dock where you might have shipping trucks that come in and you offload uh, materials into your warehouse or, or shop or wherever that might be. Uh, there's some new requirements for dock boards and this has this a nice nice bright red one here that we can see in the picture. They need to be capable of supporting their intended load. So in this case, you know, a forklift. If you're going to drive a forklift across it, it needs to be able to support uh, the weight of that equipment and whatever, whatever weight you may put on it. They need to be designed to prevent the transfer vehicle from running off the dock board edge. So you used to just see a lot of these dock boards that were flat. Well, this one in the picture has these nice edges on it, and it, it keeps it so those wheels on that forklift don't slide off the edge and fall off. There's been a lot of accidents on, on these working surfaces from, from forklifts or uh, pallet jacks or other things running off the side of these uh, dock boards, and that's one thing that OSHA put into place that's new, is to have those sides to keep things from falling off. Uh, the dock board should be secured. There should be a way to secure that in place and should have handholds for safe handling of the dock boards. So there's some, some key things there to watch for if you do have those. 
Uh, rope descent systems was the other one we talked about. Like I said, anchorages need to be identified, tested, and certified by the building owner. It's, it's up to that building owner to make sure and certify that. Uh, they need to support at least 5,000 pounds. Employees need to be trained on it, need to have proper rigging, proper anchorages, and like with any type of fall protection, there's got to be some type of rescue available. So before anybody goes and works at height, before they're using fall protection equipment, you need to think about what happens if they fall, what am I going to do about it, how am I going to rescue them and get them down, whether that's uh, sending someone to, to get them or getting them down with aerial lifts or, or ladders or whatever it may be. You need to have a rescue plan for any type of fall protection or elevated work where you, there's potential for a fall. And so each, each employer, each organization has the duty to have fall protection. Okay, this is in the standard. Uh, wherever it is, whether it's going up and down a ladder, whether it's working on, on a roof or working on an open edge, there needs to be some type of fall protection there. It's up to the employer to do that. So this applies to stairways, roofs, rope descent systems, ladders, wherever it may be. Any type of holes uh, where materials could fall through, there needs to be protections for that. Any drop-offs, any open edges, that's where we have the duty to provide fall protection. Okay, so here's a video here I want to show you. You can see that this uh, worker has this hatch that opens up behind here, and they go on down into this lower level, but they don't bother to tell uh, the lady that's working here in the front. She doesn't realize that floor is open, and whoops, there she goes, falls down into the opening. You can imagine how bad that had to have hurt with some stairs there as she falls down. Uh, but those are things that we can watch for. That's a walking, working surface that was changed. When that hole opened up, it was modified. So we, we want to look for things like that in our workplace. Watch for things that we can do uh, to prevent falls. Look, look, at, look at certain open edges or floor openings or, or you know, any gaps or anything you might work on where you could trip and fall or have some type of an accident. That's, that's just one example. Here's other examples that we've seen from other, other places we've gone and visited around the state. Uh, here we have an upper upper work area, and they've done a really good job of putting some guardrails up there. You know, it, it keeps it blocked. It keeps people from falling off the edges. It's visible. They've got it painted red. It's, it's, it's something you can easily see, and those railings are there to keep people from falling off. That's a great example. Other examples we see are uh, mechanic shops where, the, where there's uh, floor openings, or maybe you have pits where they go and work under. Uh, there's some things that you can put in place there to prevent falls into those pits and holes, and one of those could be uh, safety nets across it, or it could be guardrails, it could be chains, um, boards or covers, some, ki some kind of plate to put over the top. There's a lot of different covers that you can put there so that people aren't just walking by, maybe tripping on a hose and falling into a, to a, a lower level like that. So there's one example of things to watch for. Other places we've gone, I, I went to one place one time, we had a stairway, and we went up this little stairway, turned into this room, and came out, and there was a door. And, and the door, it, as you open, is like, like this picture here. You can see it has an open edge uh, where if you open that door, there's nothing there to step on. And, and that could really surprise somebody if you don't have things blocked off or labeled or guarded. Uh, you could really have a problem. So OSHA requires anything more than four feet in height uh, be guarded with some type of barrier, uh, door, or, or something physically there to, to prevent someone from falling through. Those are other examples in the workplace that we've seen. Um, looking at fall protection systems, there's a lot of different types. There are certain specifications they have. If, if it's a temporary or a permanent installation, there's still requirements that need to be met. Uh, this picture is an example of a guardrail system. You can see it, it's placed around a, an open edge and keeps people from falling down into an open area to a lower level. So that's one example. There's also safety net systems, and there's also requirements for fixed ladders, like we talked about earlier, where fall protection systems may be required. Uh, this standard does not talk about personal fall arrest system, this, this 1910.29. But there's another one that does, and it will talk about uh, the requirements there. One of the main things that there is is that the employer needs to provide training to their employees. So the deadline was in May, and, and earlier this year we provided uh, fall protection and slip trip fall prevention trainings in our, in our regional training topics. And, and there's also other trainings that we have available for this. But, but this is part of your training. You need to make sure that your employees that work at height, uh, where there's potential for falls or slips, that they get the training that they need that they know how to use equipment and have what they need. This, this applies to personal fall arrest systems. It applies to any type of fall or any open leading edge work, uh, equipment hazards, use of fall protection systems. They need to have that training and they need to have it by a qualified person, someone who knows and understands and can train them with what they need. So what we can do um, in every organization, at every entity, what can we do to prevent slips, trips, and falls? What can we do to prevent these accidents? Uh, here's some, some key things that stand out. One is design your workplace and your processes 
Design them in a way that you can eliminate the hazards, that you make it easier on your employees, that, they're there, that maybe they don't have to work at height, or maybe they're not stepping over things or tripping over things or not working near ledges. Maybe there's guardrails that can be installed in the places you work that can really prevent those claims. That's something we can do. Another thing we can do is our good housekeeping. Make sure things are picked up. Keep your walkways clear. Uh, pay attention to where you're walking. Safe walking practices. And what would that be? Maybe we're not looking at our phone as we're walking. Maybe we use handrails as we're going up and down stairs. Maybe we're just paying a little bit more attention to each step that we take and not getting distracted. Those can lead to preventing, preventing claims there as well. Wear proper footwear. Think about the type of shoes you wear, whether it's boots or shoes or, or just general, general shoes for the office. Think about the type of footwear that you wear that, that's the most safe, that's not gonna cause you to roll your ankle or trip or slip on some ice outside. Wear some good footwear that can prevent that. And another key thing is learn to fall properly. As I mentioned, a lot of people when they go to fall, their first instinct is to put their arms out and try to catch themselves, and that often leads to injury. There's certain ways that we can fall, maybe by, by doing the tuck and roll maneuver where you bring your arms in and kind of roll on your side. Uh, may look funny, but you may save yourself from, from hurting your shoulder or having something more serious. So if we go to fall, let's, let's prevent the accident from the fall itself. Let's learn from those things. Uh, documentation is one of the best things you can do. Uh, OSHA, OSHA goes by this rule, you know, if, if it's not documented, then there's, there's no way of proving that something happened. Well, as with anything, with any training, with any inspections, with any maintenance or, or new installs of anything like that, make sure that you're documenting those things, that you have the, the things that show that things were done correctly. Keep your training records, keep copies of rosters, uh, show that inspections are being done. Documentation is key to showing that you're doing the things you need to do. And it might remind you when it's time to redo it as well. So, so keep your documentation there. Uh, looking at fall protection system. This, these two guys here, they, they've got the buddy system going on. And the buddy system's good and it's great in the workplace, but it's not an approved method of fall protection. As you can see here, these guys could easily fall down either side of that roof and have a serious problem. There are certain fall protection systems that are effective if they're set up right and if they're used properly and if employees are trained. Uh, here's some examples of those fall arrest systems fall restraint systems, and we'll look at some of these, uh, guardrails, safety net systems, covers on any hole on any surface that you work on, keeping things from falling through, and some other alternative methods. I'll show you some examples of these, of how you can use those in your workplace. Uh, this is the personal fall arrest system that we talked about. And, and this is where you have a worker that wears a harness, and he's attached to a lifeline or a lanyard that, that catches them. If they fall off of a surface or if they fall from height, uh, this, this connection that they have, this lanyard or lifeline, is going to catch them and keep them from falling and hitting the ground. So it's, it's, it's called personal fall arrest because it, it helps the individual and catches them when they fall. Uh, the anchorage needs to be capable of supporting 5,000 pounds. When somebody falls, there's a lot of impact that goes involved in that. There's a lot of force and trauma on the body, and that anchorage needs to at least hold that much. Uh, they'll have a shock absorber in these lanyards. And what that does is it limits the arresting force on the body to less than 1,800 pounds. Uh, even though all that force is there with, with gravity pulling and the weight of the individual and the speed that they're falling, there's a lot of force when they come to a quick stop. But that shock absorber takes that out of it and it limits it so that there's not too much force on the body. And it also limits that fall to no more than six feet so it can catch somebody. Okay, so that's, that's one example there. The components that go into a personal fall arrest system, or there's, there's several things. One is the harness. The, the, the employee needs to wear the harness. They need to wear it correctly. But there's also the anchorage. You know, what are they, what are they attaching that, that lanyard or that lifeline to? Does it hold enough pounds? You know, and here, here's some examples of those in the pictures here on the left. Uh, bottom left, that's a roof anchor where you can take some 16D penny nails and nail them into to the top of a roof where there's some truss members. And it's got a little ring there that you can snap to that, that can help workers on the roof. Uh, the one on the upper right, this is a beam strap. It can go around beams. It can go around other things that might hold 5,000 pounds. And it's also got that ring with, that you can take your snap hook to and, and attach it right to it. So those are examples. Uh, there's carabiners that make the connections between uh, rings and snap hooks. That, that's all there to help with that for the connections. And, and there's the deceleration devices like this top left. You can see that lanyard. It has a little black uh, shock absorbing pack on it. What happens is when the, the employee falls, that shock absorber deploys and, and, and makes it so that there's not too much force on the body. So those are just some of the components, but, but it's critical that you know what those are before you go to wear one of these, before you go to use it and work at height. You need to know the components. You need to know how to use it properly 
to protect yourself. Um, here's other examples. There's, there's other examples of lifelines. This is a self-retracting lifeline, and, and they come in a little, uh, kind of like a little yo-yo is what they call it. What it is is that cable will go in and out as the, walk, as the worker walks around. That cable can come in and out, and as soon as they fall, within two feet it catches, and it catches just like, just like when you're wearing your seatbelt in the car. When you pull on that seatbelt really hard and, it, and, and fast and it stops, it's the same concept with these lifelines. They catch, and they catch that employee from falling and hitting the ground below. So same requirements there. Uh, fall restraint systems. This is another option. People that work on roofs or leading edges, they'll have they'll have a lanyard on and a, and a harness on, but it's set up in a way that they can't get over that edge. You can see in the picture here on the left, he's running along a cable. He's got a lifeline attached to a cable, and it can slide along that cable, but he can't get any closer to the edge of that roof, and it restricts them. It restrains them from getting over that edge. That's another effective system of fall protection. So you may consider that if you work on roofs or elevated surfaces. There might be anchorages or, or cables or lines that you can set up that can re restrain the workers from falling over the edge. It's a really effective way to do that. Um, the anchorages on these uh, need to be at least 3,000 pounds. The reason why they're less is because the employee is not falling. There's no, there's no extra, extra weight from the fall. It's only going to hold them uh, from falling over the edge. Okay? Um, other examples are guardrails. These are used in, in many places. You've seen these, such as a stair rail. Uh, Elevated work surfaces have these. You can have permanent ones installed or temporary ones. This is a, a construction project in, in this picture where they have two by fours where they've taken that and built their guardrails. Whatever material it is, whether it's chains or, or cables or pipe or, or, or anything like that, it needs to hold at least 200 pounds if you push on it horizontally. So it needs to be able to hold at least 200 pounds. Uh, they should have a top rail, a mid rail, and tow boards at the bottom, kind of like this picture does um, here in the picture here. So there's another example, guardrails. Safety nets. Uh, these aren't used as widely. Sometimes they're used on uh, bridge work where people are installing bridges. It keeps workers from falling into water when they're working over water. They're also used on the side of big, big buildings uh, with construction of buildings. But safety nets like the others, they need to support at least 5,000 pounds. And how do you know that? Well, they have to do a drop test where they take a big object and they drop it to make sure that that safety net can hold that weight. Uh, they need to be inspected regularly for wear and damage. Openings in the webbing can be no bigger than six inches by six inches. Uh, there's certain requirements for the sizing there. And it should be no more than 30 feet below the working surface so that the, empl the employee that falls off or if objects fall off, it's not falling any more than 30 feet down. Those are other examples of fall protection. Covers are, are another thing that, that uh, OSHA requires. If there's any hole in a working surface that you have, and, and they, they consider a hole to be anything two inches or more. If it's two inches by two inches or bigger, uh, that's considered a hole where objects can fall through and hurt somebody below. Uh, OSHA requires that these things be covered, that they support at least two times the load. So if somebody's going to walk on it, uh, the intended load there would be at least two times the weight of an average person. Uh, they need to be secured in place. They need to be marked with uh, the words that say hole or cover, notif notifying the workers there that there's a hole there below that that cover. So those are things to check on. When it comes to fall protection, there's a couple of different types. There's two main methods. One is the conventional and the other is the alternative and there's differences between the two. The one on the left is a conventional fall protection method. This is where you have an actual tie-off where somebody has a harness or lanyard or lifeline. They're physically tied off, whether it's a personal fall arrest system or restraint. There's a way to catch that employee or keep them from falling and restraining them. That's, that's a very effective way. The other one on the right is called an alternative method of fall protection, and this is used sometimes in uh, residential home building. And in this case, there's not any type of tie-off. There's no physical restraint. There's no physical barrier. It's just in this case, they have a warning line system with a monitor watching the employees work at the leading edge. And as you can see, if those employees go to fall, there's nothing to catch them. It's not as effective. But there is somebody keeping an eye on things, watching them, warning them, notifying them when they're, when they're getting close to the edge and, and things like that. So we don't recommend the alternative method. Uh, we do recommend the conventional method. And, and in certain cases, the alternative is acceptable, but, but in most cases in general industry, it's going to be the conventional that's required. So make sure we have good tie-offs, good anchorages, good systems set up for that. One of the key things about fall protection and working at height and working on different surfaces is, is inspecting your equipment. If you, if you get a tear or a nick or a cut in it, it can be weakened. And if you go to fall, 
uh, you could you could not have your equipment work right. And so it's important that you check those things out. Regularly inspect your components. Look for anything missing. Look for anything deteriorating, and and take those things out of service if they're not in good condition. It's not worth chancing your life on those things. Uh, another key thing about fall protection equipment is maintain it. Take care of it. Uh, I've seen several job sites where where employees are leaving their harness laying in the dirt. Uh, maybe they get grease and oil on it, and it starts to deteriorate things. Or maybe their their lanyards are really old, and they're getting frayed and starting to break. Make sure you maintain those things. Keep it clean. Keep it stored in a good, safe, dry area. And if it's ever exposed to a fall, if it's ever used um, during a fall, take it out of service and get a new one. It's not worth chancing that with your life. Um, as mentioned, you know, with any any type of work at height, when you're using fall protection equipment, whether it's from a fixed ladder or any other walking working surface that's up in the air, you have to have a rescue plan. You have to know, uh, you know, how are you going to get somebody down if they fall? If they're left hanging there for a long time, they can have some real trauma on their body. Uh, this is an example of what they have are some suspension uh, trauma straps. And what, what they have is on the side of the harness, you can attach these little pouches where when somebody falls, they can deploy these little steps, these little stirrups that come out, and they can step into that and get that blood flowing properly to their legs so that they're not just hanging there in the harness cutting off their circulation. So think about that. Think about how, how quickly can you get somebody down and what's your plan to get somebody down if they do fall. That's, that's part of your fall protection plan. So we've looked at a lot of different uh, walking and working surface types. A lot of this was geared toward fixed ladders, uh, which are some of the new updates in that new standard. A lot of it geared toward just looking at regular working surfaces, whether it's stairways, uh, climbing up ladders or ramps or slopes, uh, looking at the walking paths, making sure those are clear. Those are things that we've looked at today. And, and it's all to make a difference in preventing slip trips and falls. Uh, realize that the trust is here to help. We have lots of different trainings available such as this one. We have webinars that we've done in the past that are recorded and on our website that talk about fall protection, that talk about preventing slips, trips, and falls. Those trainings are out there. Uh, we've also got it with our regional trainings that we do every year. Uh, there's good topics out there and we encourage you to take part in that. If you ever have a question about uh, ladders or proper setup or uh, working at Hyde, if you have questions, we're here to help and, and help answer those questions for you. So don't hesitate to reach out to us for those things. In summary, we've talked about designing the workplace. You know, design it in a way that you can eliminate the slips, trips, and falls, that we can prevent those accidents in the workplace and keep people from falling. Um, as mentioned, it's one of the leading causes. It's one of the most costly types of claims that we have. And, and it's one of the most frequent that we see year after year is slip trips and falls. And so we need to really keep our awareness up on that and prevent those um, as a group here. So main, maintain our housekeeping. Make sure that things are picked up. Keep your walking paths clean and clear and, and in good order. Do regular inspections. Go through your workplaces uh, regularly. Look at those places where someone might trip or fall or, or have a problem with. Let's look at those things and make sure they're addressed. Uh, look at keeping your employees trained. That should be an ongoing thing updating training, keeping the documentation of that, and keeping each other aware of the hazards. Those are the things that will lead to uh, preventing the claims and, and reducing those. And so that's that's our recommendation there for those things. Uh, we've covered a lot today. I know, you know there's a lot of information there and kind of some technical things. There's a lot more information in the standards if you want to read through that. Um, we've hit on some of the high level things and some of the key changes, but we encourage you to be aware of that and, and keep each other safe. So with that, uh, before everybody drops off and falls off of the webinar, does anybody have a question? Jason, any questions there? No, we've only had one question so far, and that was just uh, pertaining to training, if, if the trust offers uh, this type of training. And, and, uh, and I responded to Michael on that, that yeah, we do, we do this type of training. Or, you know, one of the ways you could do is, is we'll, we're recording this session, and this could be a good base uh, basic training to get you started on that and then do some specifics as far as the hazards that you're dealing with in the workplace as well as the type of equipment that you're using. Does that sound good? Absolutely. Yeah, that's right on. You definitely want to be trained on the specific equipment for sure. And it could be different. It could be different for each job site. So you're right on there. Yeah. Um, that looks like that's all the questions we have, but this is a serious, this is a serious issue. We look at some of the, some of the incidents that have happened um, over the last year, and, uh, and, and it's kind of scary um, what has happened. Um, and we really need to take this serious. We need, we need to train our people so they're aware of the hazards and, and what's out there. I, I really appreciate Brent, the work he's done to put this together. Um, if you do have questions, give us a call, email us, and we'll be happy to help out. Brent, last word. 
that's it. Everybody be safe out there. Don't slip and fall. Oh, be I careful. Think I froze up. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear me or not, folks, but uh, I hope you guys have a great day and uh, and and be safe out there.